My name's Eric Stoner. I know I've heard it all before. You can't hit me with anything I haven't heard before. Uh, but we're going to end today's fun with a presentation on the Northern Lights. So just a quick little raise of hands. Who's actually seen them before? Oh, wow. OK, a good many of you. So that's bumming me out a little bit, because you guys already have seen this stuff. But OK, so who hasn't seen them? Just raise your hand. OK, all right. So it's about 50-50. So all right. Um, so those that have seen them, have you seen them like really, really glorious, or just kind of seen a little bit of stuff in the sky? Just eh? OK, all right. All right. So then I hope this presentation is going to be enjoyable for you, because uh, the trip that I made to Fairbanks, Alaska was in March. And why March? And I'll get into that. But the main reason is um, it's during the spring equinox. And that's when typically the most activity is going on. Uh, and, and Fairbanks is really one of the best places in the United States, anyway, to see the Northern Lights. And so, uh, you know, we decided to go there. And the first thought, this has been, you know, we were planning this months in advance, and I, and I thought, okay, my gosh, start doing research about cold weather, because I'm not a big fan of it. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, okay, so what do I got to do? I talked to my, my friend, Charles Glatzer, who's one of our Canon Explorers of Light. He sa I said, what, what kind of gear do I need to get? He says, okay, you got to get this, 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 and this. And it was like $1,500 later, you know. I'm like, I I'm just going for a week. I mean, you know. So I ended up buying this, this parka that was like $800. I'm like, I could go to Mount Everest with 80 below, 80 below temperatures. And it was way overkill, so I returned it. And I uh, figured I would get something that I could use throughout the year. But anyway, I just want to give you a quick little um, taste of what we're going to talk about today. And this is kind of what was very typical of what I saw in Alaska. And, uh, when I got back, most of the people said to me, oh man, that's on my bucket list. It's a bucket list thing. So those of you who have not seen it, would you think that that's like on your bucket list? So I will say, after having seen it now for a solid eight days, you must see it, <laughs> okay? You really have to, because it's something before you move on to another place in your life or in this world, it, it's really something you should see. And, and not just see because it happened to have just enough oomph to make it to the northern plains of the United States. Uh, make it a, a point to go to a place like Fairbanks or Iceland or Norway where you're going to be blown out of your shoes when you see it. Uh, and don't forget to take a camera. Okay, it's one thing to be to see it with your naked eye, but it's a completely different thing with the results you experience from photographing it. Those of you who have seen it, those that raised their hand when you saw it, have you photographed it? Okay, all right. So not as many of you. You video. Okay, so try. Oh, video is extremely hard, and I'll go over the technical reasons for that in a little bit. So I'm just going to give you a little taste of what I saw. Wide-angle lenses are the name of the game in general terms. There's always a reason to, to break those rules. But in essence, you're, you know, the, when you just sit down, like if you sat down and did a snow angel and just looked straight up, uh, it's dancing all over the place. So enjoy it. Now, you're, if you're going to be laying down in, in March in Alaska, it's kind of cold, and you're probably going to be laying on some snow. So be prepared. And I have some general boring slides on what to prepare. But this whole presentation is designed to give you, the photographer, the tools that you're going to need to go and photograph this for the very first time. It takes the learning curve from this to this. And it, it, it's easier when somebody's holding your hand and saying, this is what you need to do, instead of going there blindly and saying, OK, now what? So that, this will hopefully open your eyes a little bit to see the possibilities. And this is no different when you're talking about composition. And there's a little section here about composition. You can see what's going on here. When it's bright enough, then you can begin to compose your photograph with something in the foreground to create more interest in and something to hold uh, the, the, the viewer's eye 
to the ground and then be able to view what else is going on in the background. So all kinds of beautiful things. Now this is not the sun, obviously, that's the moon. Um, some people would argue that photographing the aurora under anywhere between a, a half of a moon and a full moon is a waste of time. I would disagree with that. Um, you can still see plenty of uh, aurora activity with those conditions. It's just not as bright and brilliant. Um, the conditions I dealt with was no more, it was a quarter moon to a half a moon. And that was, in my opinion, perfect because you got just enough light reflection from the moon uh, onto the surface area in front of you to give you an idea of what's there and not just be in silhouette. So, uh, so then I you know, started walking around in the woods and started looking up and photographing some things that way just to give it a little different view. Of course, we're looking at really wide angle lenses. So you're getting that, you know, that, that convergence of lines where you know, if you're an architectural photographer, you're like, no, I need a tilt shift lens. Well, that's not gonna be always the best option either. So now, one thing that when we were photographing this, uh, this just happened. And so somebody said to me, you know, God did that. Do you guys see the G there? All right. Yeah, looks, like an e for looks like an E for Eric. Where, what are you looking at? I see a G. I, I don't know. Uh, anyway, so the craziest things happen and it's constantly changing. It's shape, it's, it's just a it's whole overall feel. And then you'll get these sheets of light that'll drop down from the sky. And then you get this thing called the corona, which is the center point of the aurora directly over your head. And it's pulsating, it's amazing to look at. So this is, you know, we took a group of photographers out there and, um, you know, I had to chronicle that as well. So you see a lot of these people, this was the first time they'd ever seen the Northern Lights. And it's, it's just an amazing thing. So, and then, you know, we ended up getting into some other areas where uh, there's a thermal fed river or a stream that doesn't freeze. Everything else is rock solid. Like you could cross a river with a car, no problem. Uh, but this thermal fed stream or river keeps it nice. So now you're getting, I'll show you some images in a few minutes where you get nice reflections off the water. So those are really good things. And at the end, remind me, if you want somebody in the room, who's gonna be in charge? Who wants, raise your hand, somebody who's, okay. Be in charge to remind me to show you how to use the GPS feature from, and turn GPS on so you know, okay, here's where I was, and if I ever wanna go back there, this is how to do it. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but as I was m meandering around off by myself, which I generally don't recommend, uh, because a lot can happen, you can get lost. It's always good to have a buddy with you, but you know, I'm kind of stubborn that way, so I just do what I want to do. And then I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what if a bear jumps out and gets me? And, I, you know, and then I'm thinking, it's March, it's 11 below. There's no bears out there. They're hibernating. They're smart. So uh, those thoughts come into your mind. But actually, one of the biggest, in Alaska, one of the biggest issues with causing human death, aside from airplane crashes, is moose. So watch out for moose, because they will do some damage to you. But uh, so this is what the highways look like. They're just straight, because there's, no, no, there's not much out there to move around except for mountains. Alaska uh, in Fairbanks, it's not very mountainous right there. You're kind of in a valley. So there's not a lot of terrain you have to maneuver around. Um, but this just stuff happens and it's just amazing to capture. Now we're talking about exposures that are in the neighborhood of anywhere between three, two, two seconds to, up to upward of about eight, eight seconds. And that's about it. Uh, and the rest is handled through ISO and wide lens apertures. But there's all different ways you can compose this and it almost kind of looks like a sunset with the aurora in there. But So let's go over some of the, the, the specifics. Here's what I want to cover today. All right, first thing, what is the aurora borealis? Okay, why is that phenomenon happen? Um, then we'll get into planning and, and cold weather gear, as I said. Uh, forecasting, there's lots of cool apps that you can use. I'll talk about one specifically that I use to help forecast, okay, what kind of a night is it gonna be for the Aurora and when can I expect to go out to see it? Because it, 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 it arrives generally at a certain time, um, but it could be later. There's lots of variables that go into figuring that out. Camera gear, of course, we want to figure out, we want to prepare ourselves and figure out what the, what the gear is we need to bring beforehand. So we'll talk about that. 
Um, exposure and, of course, in composition, um, all these things, when you're talking about moonlit skies, you can see a lot more in front of you. It takes about 30 minutes for your eyes to adjust from regular light, like if you're in a car and the dome light's on or something, and you go outside, or even if you're just in a building and go outside, it takes about 30 full minutes for your eyes to really adjust to see a lot more than what you would ordinarily. So, uh, and then um, we'll talk about uh, time-lapse. Time-lapse is really cool. You'll start seeing how this stuff moves. I have an example that I will show you of some time-lapse. And if you've never seen a time-lapse, or as we, you know, we talked about doing video is very difficult because in general, what's the slowest shutter speed you can use in video, generally speaking? Like, probably like a 30th of a second. If you're talking 30 frames per second, which is pretty standard, even 24, it's still around 30th of a second. So you can't capture that much unless you're talking really, really high ISOs, and then you start losing image quality uh, for that. So video is a little more difficult. So time lapse is one of the big alternate ways of capturing, capturing that video. And I'll show you a, a, a time lapse that was done over the course of an hour with 450 images. And it's pretty amazing. Okay, and then finally, doing portraits. I'm a portrait photographer by trade. This is my 30th year as a professional photographer, and I, I, I'm more of a, so when I'm out there, I'm not normally a landscape kind of guy. I'm, I'm always looking, okay, how can we start incorporating a portrait into this? And of course, with a new moon, meaning that there's no moon, it's very difficult to do that at two in the morning when there's no source of light. Um, but then, I figured out some ways that we could create some cool things. Uh, so anyway, what is an aurora? Well, um, th these lights, obviously, you can, you've seen, they, they dance across the sky in, in amazing, beautiful colors. And when you first look at it, you don't really necessarily understand why it's happening. Well, the reason why it's happening is this. You've got um, solar storms on the sun. Anybody ever hear of sunspots? Okay, so those are solar storms and they create a disturbance in the magnetic field, usually at the, you know, the, the north or the south pole. That's where they tend to gravitate because of magnetic activity. And um, that's where, where you get these charged particles with, that get interfered with the solar storm or winds, solar winds. That's what creates the color. And so I don't necessarily understand it. I'm not a scientist, but I just know that when I look up there, I see it, and that's all I really care about, you know? So um, it's interesting. And so the best place to see them, as I said before, uh, in, in the, the United States is, in my opinion, uh, Fairbanks. So North and so South Pole, the problem with the South Pole is it's very difficult to get to. Um, there's, and almost most of the time in the winter, that area is over ocean. So that presents another challenge. So uh, the common colors you'll see, generally, obviously, green is the, the most common color. Um, violet, red, and then blue is a very rare, rare color. Um, but you know, when you're working in, very bless you, when you're working with very high activity solar storm uh, times of year, and you don't know when that's gonna be, those types of colors can present themselves. So you, you just heard a couple of references to it. When you're looking at the northern lights with your naked eye, it doesn't seem as brilliant. When you look at a picture like this, you say, well, that wasn't really what I saw with my naked eye. But when I take a photograph with it at four to six seconds, now all of a sudden, that, that color is getting kind of burned in, if you will, into the sensor and now you're getting that brilliant color that that tends to appear. So uh, that's generally the reason for it. You, you will see uh, with your naked eye, you'll see a lot of great colors happening. They're just not as brilliant um, with the eye. So uh, with that, planning is like one of the most important things that you can do. So best times of year, we've, we've talked about uh, the, the equinox, which generally happens in March, followed by April, and then uh, September and October are two of the other really good areas. Uh, but the problem with September, October is that the daylight hours are longer that time of year. So uh, you're gonna miss out. We, we would go out at 
10 o'clock in the evening and not get back until 6 a.m. We were there all night. And it's difficult when you're flying, especially from the East Coast, changing the time. It's only four hours difference, but you're, it's a long way to travel. And you've got that time change, and then now you're, you know, you're used to working your nine to five, and then you go there, and now you're, you're pulling a third shift. You gotta get your sleep during the day. So you're sleeping during the day, and then you're working all night. So those times of year are best. Generally, we found that between 10, or 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. have at least that time when I was there, that produced the most activity. Uh, it's still there uh, most of the time, and, it's, and it comes and goes. If you think, okay, all right, it's ending, and then I don't see it anymore, and you go home, you may have missed the boat because the next round is coming 30 minutes later, and it might have been even more brilliant than the first round. So you gotta stick it out a little bit and you know, bring some, some fun games that you can play in the car with your friends. If you, unless you want to hang out outside. and you want to, The first week, the first day I was there, uh, it was pretty cold. So you got to be prepared. So best place to see, obviously, outside uh, or inside the United States, Alaska, the northern area, Fairbanks, like I said. And then outside uh, Iceland, uh, Yellowknife Canada is a great place to see it. Norway and New Zealand, other, you know, if you want to travel. Iceland seems to be a really hotbed for people wanting to, you know, travel there right now. So, um, there's great places there to see it. But if you want to stay, st uh, you know, in the state side, I would go to Fairbanks. So, okay, cold weather. There's me. I mean, we're all bundled up. And, and I think the biggest thing is layers. So it was bitter cold. And it got warmer while we were there. When we were there the first night, um, 11 below. And that, that was, you know, easy to take. But that was without the wind chill. <laughs> so... Uh, with the wind chill, it was about minus 35. I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't hang like that. <laughs> I, I like it, you know, 70. It's perfect. Um, so, plus the other thing is I have poor circulation. So, there's a reason why I told you I overcompensated when I bought this big $800 parka that I'll never ever use any other time unless I go, you know, up to the summit of, you know, Mount Everest or here. But layers is key. Don't overdo it. Um, but don't be the guy or girl that didn't prepare properly. What are the things that make you, when you're out in the cold, what are the things that make you not want to be out there anymore? What parts of your body, hands and feet, generally. Now, I will say, if your core is warm, you're generally okay, because that, if you have good circulation, you should be fine. As soon as your feet get cold, you're like, I don't want to be out here anymore. Same thing with your fingers. So just be prepared for that. And I bought a whole case of hand warmers and you know, that helps tremendously, especially in weather like that. So cold weather gear. This is the most boring slide, but it is helpful. Layers are best. You know, you've always heard this from mom. Dress in layers, right? You know, that's what you do. Well, there's a reason why that's the way it is, because it, it works. All right, base layer, um, do not wear cotton next to your skin, why? Well, it absorbs the moisture and then gets, stays, it stays wet. And then if you get cold, that's gonna make you even more willing to go inside and warm up because that's, so get something, uh, long johns that, uh, that have a synthetic material uh, that's moisture wicking, things like that. Um, fleece on a mid layer is a lifesaver. That's really good. Uh, goose down for your parka or a shell with um, like a goose down under jacket that's fairly lightweight. All those goose down parkas are pretty lightweight. Um, no reason to go super, super heavy. It's just the right material makes all the difference in the world. But that's key. Um, insulated snow pants, again, this is critical because you are gonna be in it. You're in, I'm talking in it. Where we were most of the time was, was packed down by snowmobile tracks, but the second you go off that track, you're flying down four feet. So, and you could get stuck, which I did. So it's always good to, again, travel with a buddy and have somebody that can kind of yank you out. Uh, but good snow pants are, are critical. Uh, thermal winter boots, good ones. And I say that, I'm not talking about just going to your local store and buying boots that are waterproof, no. Thermal winter boots, critical. What? 
ice fishing boots. <laughs> I haven't done that, but it's not on my bucket list either. Um, anybody ever hear this, a balaclava? This is, this is face protection. And it's basically a hood or some sort of face protection because when that wind starts blowing and it's minus 35, you're gonna wish you had something to cover the face. And get something that has good ventilation. If you try, I wore my eyeglasses one night when I was out there and I'm sorry I did it. I wanted to, to try it. But the second all that moisture from your breath starts coming up and hitting your glasses, you're fogged up and you can't see a darn thing. So if you wear contacts, that's great. I was so over uh, saturated with trying to figure out all the things that I could do. I went to my eye doctor and I said, are my contact lenses gonna freeze to my eyes? <laughs> and she said, no, you're an idiot. But <laughs> like, it's, <laughs> it's the kind of relationship I have with my eye doctor. But these are the questions that I had to ask. And when, sh you, when, someone's, when a speaker says to you, there's no such thing as a stupid question, that's a lie. So I asked the stupid question and I got a stupid answer, which was great. So uh, glove liners, these are basically what they are. They're just little uh, insulated liners for your regular gloves. Now the gloves that I bought are, were really good. They were $95 gloves. And that's not something I would normally spend on gloves, but it's important. And what I did, I was trying to figure out, okay, do I get gloves, one for each finger, or do I get a mitten? If I have a mitten, then I can't really you know, maneuver my camera the way I want. So I bought this thing at REI. It, it had a mitten for my three fingers and a, what's it called? Lobster claw. A lobster claw, that makes sense. So this finger and my thumb were in a glove kind of a form so I could do, you know, camera operations. And then the rest of it was good. So that was covered up with uh, the rest of the mitten type material. And then um, hand and toe warmers, just buy a, a bunch of those. They last usually for about six or seven hours. Um, the best thing I could say is start them 30, crack them open 30 minutes before you go need them. Because if you, if you crack it open outside in the weather, they don't warm up as quickly and, and not as, as vigorously as you would if you open them up in, in like inside your car or inside the hotel, wherever you're staying, and then go out. Just an observation that I made. Okay, now, Aurora Forecasting. The, I use this website called solarham.com. And uh, this was crucial to figuring out what the forecast was gonna be like. This is the North and South Pole. Uh, and this was actually, this screen grab was actually taken last week. So you can see that Alaska over here is just getting barely brushed by the aurora this time of year. So this time of year, probably not very good for that. Plus this was also taken during the day. The nighttime is over here, the dark side of that. And um, you can see it actually, south this is all dark over here. This is the South Pole. So they're, they're in complete darkness there. So that's really, you know, you're gonna have a good uh, aurora there. But there's also this thing called the KP index on, this is a, like, this is the sun there's, they'll give you a different activity with sunspots and they'll tell you that. Now, if you have a sunspot or a solar storm, usually it takes between a day and three days to arrive here on Earth. And they will give you forecasting to let you know based on those solar storms if you're gonna have a really great night or a moderate night or maybe a light night. And the KP index is this green, these, you see this down here, this two to, and the five. The, the KP index is, is a scale that goes from one to nine. Nine being like the best ever, and one being okay, like here it is, just a little bit of an aurora activity. And zero, obviously, you're not getting anything. But this is a really good indicator of the kind of night you're gonna have. And uh, this June 1st was just, what's that, two days ago? Um, was a five, that's pretty darn good. Uh, when we were there, we were experiencing anywhere between three and six. So we had a really good week. Um, I'm not gonna say that I'm an expert at all this, this, these numbers and stuff like that, but I would say if you're really interested in it, go to the website and there's lots of other activity. There's lots of other places you can get this information as well. Uh, but if you wanna geek out on it, go and, and digest it and, and understand it really well. I'm not that guy to give you that information, but that's the source. So find, uh, the field gear here that I'm, I used on my trip was the 5D Mark IV. Um, lenses are, are kind of limited. You don't need uh, to bring a lot of stuff. 
the 16 to 35 was what I used most of the time. And that was a 2.8 lens. You need 2.8 or faster. If you have an F4 lens, that means your exposures are gonna be much longer and you're gonna probably not be as happy as, as if you had a 2.8 lens. Uh, because once, that, once the, the lights start dancing, you're going to want a shorter exposure to kind of freeze the action. And so the 14 millimeter was another great lens I think we found if you want to get more of the sky. Um, I didn't actually try our 8 to 15 fisheye, but that's another option. Uh, the only problem with that is that's an F4 lens. So you could make it work, but I wouldn't make it a, a, a must, uh, you know, go-to lens, so to say, for this. Uh, the 24-1.4 is another good one if you want, uh, you know, super fast. Uh, that way your exposures can be fairly, really short, and then you start seeing these sheets of light just drop, and you get, you kind of freeze that action. That was really helpful. If, you, if your camera doesn't have a GPS uh, receiver in it, the 5D Mark IV does, but if your camera doesn't, there's this GPE-2 which you mount right on the hot shoe of your camera, and that will then log the, uh, the GPS data into uh, the metadata of the file. So don't forget a tripod. Uh, it sounds silly, but um, this is critical. Unless you're gonna stick your camera in the snow as your tripod, this is gonna be ne necessary. Now, my tripod has, is a Gitzo, and it has tiny legs at the very base of the tripod. So what I ended up finding was it was more like spears into the snow. And every time I put my camera, uh, the tripod in the snow, poof, it would sink down. So I ended up taking a, like a gaff tape that I had and just, I, I wrapped it and made a ball and that was enough to really prevent it from sinking in a lot of the snow. So you do what, CDs, I was fresh out of CDs. I, I didn't have any with me. No, that's a good point, yeah. Um, if you, so for the video, if you didn't hear it, if you have CDs that are corrupt or scratched, Use those. Uh, so that's a good suggestion. Although in, in the color, the, the temperatures that we were dealing with, they might just crack instantly, I don't know. Use two. Use two. <laughs> Gaff tape worked pretty good. Um, the other thing, if you are interested in doing time lapse or, or just, gen, you know, a, 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 if you're not interested in doing time lapse, it's a good idea to have uh, an electronic cable release to prevent any kind of camera shake or movement from you touching the shutter. The other w way that you can do it is set the two second delay where you push the button and then you get off the camera, it'll settle down and then it'll take the picture. But when this thing starts moving, you wanna take as many pictures as you can because it changes second by second. So having the, the uh, electronic cable release kind of is important, uh, but it's not a necessary tool unless you're doing time lapse photography. And then the last thing is you absolutely need um, a red headlamp. This is critical. Um, if you buy a headlamp that just has white light, you're going, every time you turn that light on, your eyes are gonna have to take 30 minutes to readjust. And something about the red light, I'm not, again, I should ask my eye doctor this. <laughs> She'll probably give me a snarky answer again. But uh, the red light, for some reason, a lot of military uses red light in dark situations, I guess because it's, the rods and cones aren't as sensitive to that, I'm guessing, right? You're an eye doctor, maybe? No, you just read about it on TV? You heard about it? Yeah, okay. So that's, it's a lot easier for your eyes to adjust. So red light, perfect. Uh, there are some problems with it, which I'll explain in a moment, but uh, gear prep, lots of batteries. Uh, I will say that when we were out, we didn't really have a big issue with battery drain as much as I thought. Uh, I had a, whole, a battery last me the whole night. No problem in minus 11. Uh, so, but it's always, you know, you don't want to be that person that is going to rely on that and all of a sudden, oh man, I'm out here and the things are dancing and my camera died. You know, so keep the batteries inside the warmest part of your body. Uh, put them in a pocket, interior pocket so that they're warm. That's the biggest thing because cold weather, obviously, as you know, uh, if you've ever driven a car in those types of conditions, batteries are the biggest thing. They're seriously susceptible to cold temperatures. Remove all filters. This includes um, UV filters because this will uh, change, you'll get weird reflections uh, as the light comes in the lens and you may end up flaring things out. Uh, there's no need for any filters when you're doing this type of photography. And now there are always reasons to, to 
question that uh, if you know you don't want obviously if you're rough on your gear you don't want to break the camera or whatever but somebody will probably say oh well I have a good reason and I'm not going to debate that but uh, experts that I've spoken to have said there's no benefit to having a filter on your lens especially anything like a polarizer there's nothing that it's going to do plus you're taking a stop and a half to two stops away from something that you already need the super fast lens to photograph so there's really not much of a need. Taping of your lens so you're going to uh, on the back here, let me go back to the back of the camera. There's that red light on Canon cameras, and I'm not sure, there's probably some lights on the back of other manufacturer cameras, that when the camera is exposing, this red light is on. You need to cover that up, because it will, I have a photograph that will show you how much pollution, light pollution, that provides uh, in, this, in this scene. So you'll see that in a moment, okay? Uh, and also, um, hand warmers, on, strapped on top and bottom of your lens to prevent the lens from frosting. When you're out there for a long time, uh, the lens can frost over and then you didn't even realize it and your, your pictures are kind of soft and doing some weird funky things that you didn't know. So, so basically strap with, like, with Velcro straps on the top and that will just keep your lens warm enough to prevent frost from uh, forming on top. A dry sack, if you're gonna go back into the car, leave your camera outside of the car unless you're done. Because what will happen is this. All right? And once your lens frosts over, it's gonna take a long time for that to readjust. So the dry sack will just keep, if you're gonna leave your camera outside, it'll just keep it in a nice dry place, keep away free from moisture, and also at the temperature of wherever you are. So that's kind of critical. Um, so pre-focusing your lens, to answer your question, here's a little uh, snippet on that. So obviously, set your camera on a tripod. I, I generally, there's a couple ways you can do this. What we did was we pre-focused the lens during the daytime when we had plenty of visibility. Um, you can do it at night where you have a loop, uh, one of those like Hoodman loops or something like that, and you try to focus real critically on the stars. You could do that uh, in live view, but we did it during the daytime when we could see. So first thing you do is take your lens off of autofocus because there's not much to focus on that the, lens, the sensors will be able to pick up unless you're gonna focus on the moon, uh, which you can do as well if that's out. But this is all manual focus. You're gonna take your lens, um, aim it at a street sign or something like that that's far away or you know, it, turn live view on and then hit the magnify button three times and you'll get 10 times magnification. And then from there, you take your little Hoodman loop, put it on the back of your LCD screen Make sure the Hoodman loop is adjusted already so that it's already sharp to the, for the screen. And then now you can manually focus and get it as sharp as possible. And then the last thing is to tape it. So you'll take gaff tape, tape the focusing ring to the lens itself so that's not going to move. You will not need to focus anymore after the, for the whole night. Unless you do something where you're focusing on something that's in front of you as a prop and I'll show you what happened there in a moment with, with something I did. So, uh, okay, exposure recommendations. Depends on the aurora brightness, really. Um, but in general, 3,200 to 12,800 were the ISOs that we stuck with most of the time. Uh, we were, by and large, at 6,400 a good chunk of the time. And then when things got a little more dim, we would go up to 12,800. And that camera can handle it. It's fine, it's, it's a little bit noisy, but it's not disturbing at all. I printed a 40 by 60 hanging in my home and at 12,800 and it looks really good. So don't be too concerned about that. Uh, why is aperture possible? We already told you about that, uh, 2.8 or faster. Shutter speeds between two seconds and 10 seconds. You're gonna have to experiment uh, on shutter speed, but a great place to start is four seconds, 2.8 at 6,400 ISO. That's a great starting point. And then adjust from there till you see what you like. You don't want it to, too, you just have to watch your, um, your histogram. So you don't want to blow out or wash out any detail uh, because you won't be able to get it back. So keep an eye on the histogram, make sure nothing is spiking over to the right side and you're losing that detail and you should be fine. Uh, when the lights start dancing, right, you've got to raise your ISO up. 
You don't have to, but this is a good recommendation if you want to start freezing that action. So raise your ISO up either to 6400 or 12800, and now you're at shorter two second exposures, which is totally fine. Now you say two seconds, that's not really freezing it, no. That's why I have uh, freezing here in, in quotations. In relative terms, two seconds is a pretty quick exposure for that. Okay, now you're gonna wait a lot on sometimes, especially for it to actually show up. And I suggest just waiting in your car, if it's cold, Wait in your car. Once in a while, roll your window down and point the camera out the window facing the northeast or northwest sky and just take an exposure. You don't even have to be on a tripod, just take a picture. It doesn't even matter if it's blurry. You just need to see if that aurora is approaching. And if you start seeing green in the viewfinder or in the, the picture you just took, then you know it's starting to come. So you may not see it with your eye, your naked eye. And often as it's approaching, you won't see it. But the camera will, especially at four or six seconds long, you'll start seeing the approach. You'll see a, a general a green glow at the, on the horizon for starters. And then you, know, you wait a little longer. It depends how fast it's moving. As it approaches, if you start seeing something that looks like this, it's go time. All right. Get your tripod and already prepare it outside of the car so you're not sitting there playing with the legs, getting them extended. Have it ready to go so you can mount your camera on the tripod immediately and get to where you wanna go so you can start you know, getting images in your camera. Then it's just, you know, giddy up. Get out there and start creating. You know, one thing I didn't mention was scoping out locations during the day. That's a really great idea. Figuring out things that you wanna incorporate in your framing uh, and of course, you know, it's gonna be a little difficult because you're not sure exactly where the aurora is going to be. But in generally, north, if you're in, in, uh, in Fairbanks, it's gonna come from the northeast most of the time. It travels northeast to southwest in, the most, in most cases. This is what you can expect. I mean, find great places during the day uh, when you're supposed to be sleeping. And you start creating really cool imagery, and all of a sudden all your neighbors think you're like National Geographic, right? So beautiful stuff like this happens all the time, and it changes constantly. It's amazing. You can see, I don't know if you can see, there's a little house up here on top of the hill, great view, you know? Uh, but there's, the, there's that violet in there that you see. That's really, that was, happened quite frequently when we were up there. And then it does some cool things like this, like these little things that happen, thank you, swirls. So here's some, some problems, okay? We talked about the light on the back of the camera uh, being local light pollution. So see that red on, the, on the, the ground there? That's from that little light on the back of the camera. And so all of that light hitting during a eight second exposure is hitting the, the white snow and bouncing all over and that can cause image issues later. So tape all that stuff up. Okay, and then you have um, tail lights from the car. Like, this is the parking lot we were, where we were, and somebody decided to turn their car on because they wanted the heat. They wanted heat. Shame on them. They shouldn't need that. And they have all their parkers on. But this is just tail lights from a car. So that ruined it. And then I got uh, back to the to the car to tell the people to shut the car lights off, and I saw this Mack truck or this this truck. And so this is tail lights really close. Now you say that's out of focus. Yes, it was. Because I pre-focused my lens, remember? On something really far away. One thing I would say, back, getting back to that, don't put your lens necessarily right on the infinity mark because um, the lenses have a, they, they breathe. So if you just put it on the infinity mark, that may not necessarily be where you need to be. So that's why you have to go through that procedure of pre-focusing um, and not locking it down. So just assuming that it's the infinity mark is not the way to go. But this picture is out of focus, uh, and so I realized, oh, dummy. I, so I got my flashlight out with the red light, and I focused on the text from the Peterbilt truck. And of course, this is how it should have looked. And it was just interesting, you know, I was sitting there, I think this was the 14 millimeter, um, and it's pretty sharp. So, city light pollution. Now this, the light pollution you see on the horizon there, that's Fairbanks. And Fairbanks is a pretty small city 
comparatively, there's about 70 or 80,000 people there, but there's enough light to cause light pollution like this. And again, there's another silhouette shot of one of my colleagues, uh, but you can see Fairbanks in the lower left there. So try to stay away from that. And now you could say, I really like that. That's not bad. It has an interesting appeal to it, but if you want to avoid that, don't shoot that way. <laughs> And here's this little truck here, is not a little truck, it's actually a pretty big van, but um, adding interest to the image, something to hold it down, that's part of the composition we're talking about. So as speaking of composition, now you see these sheets of light that are kind of streaking down. Those start brilliantly, those who have seen it, right? You've seen the, the sheets of lights dance, right? Who's, raise your hand if you've seen that. Okay, pretty amazing, right? So when that starts happening, you, you've got to start cranking off exposures quickly because this stuff doesn't stick around all the time. And then you get some cool things like this, that the shapes that happen, you can see all kinds of things in there if you want. And then, uh, so here's that thermal fed river that we ended up on and you get the reflections from the water, which was really cool. And then, you know, just different compositions. Now, does anybody see a, a head here? Right? What about that? That looks evil. Right? Isn't that cool? All those things happen all the time. And then like this. It's like a reverse hurricane or something. Or is that the way they go? Is that the direction? Who's my meteorologist in the room? Anyway, so it's just kind of cool. It's fun. But it is what you, what you make of it. And, and these things change constantly. Here's, now, this is called the corona. When you start seeing um, radiating lines of light from a single point and it's directly overhead, this is like really brilliant and worth going just to see this part because it is cool. All right, color temperature. We talked about white balance. Who asked the question about white balance? Okay, so here's the answer to that. These are general terms. You, you may have to adjust to taste, but when you have a new moon that's no moon, in general, around 3,500 Kelvin is a great place to start. Uh, when you have a quarter moon, now remember, the, the sun is hitting the moon and reflecting natural daylight back onto the Earth. So um, if you, you have a quarter moon, you start raising the color temperature to 4,000. A half moon, we raised it up to 4,500 or even 5,000, depending on your taste. And then uh, as a three-quarter or full moon, 5,000 back to full daylight temperature, which is 55, 5,600 Kelvin. Now you may say, well, my camera doesn't have Kelvin temperature, and that's okay, so you can adjust um, to a good starting point is at using the fluorescent setting, which is around 4,000 to 4,500 Kelvin, and then um, if you wanna go down, experiment with it. Shoot raw, by the way, and you can adjust this all later in your post-processing. You don't have to worry about it as much in camera if you've got all the data uh, in your raw file. Um, so this is just the, um, the Canon Digital Photo Professional uh, raw processing engine. And then you can, even if your camera, like you have a Rebel camera or something, and that doesn't necessarily, that model maybe necessarily doesn't do Kelvin temperature, it's still in the raw data, and you can go in here and adjust it later manually. So you can fine tune it to your liking. Okay. And then time lapse. So the TC80 N3, that's the intervalometer, but it also acts as a... Uh, uh, you know, electronic cable release. Uh, that's critical for the whole thing. But so take, set your, this uh, unit to take pictures every five to 10 seconds. And then, so the more pictures you take, the, uh, the slower that video or that, tr you know, that video is going to appear. The less pictures you take, the faster everything's gonna move once you assemble it uh, and bring it into um, uh, QuickTime. So you can assemble all those pictures in QuickTime and then it will, um, put it all together and create your movie. Okay, so here's, you saw a little bit of the video already um, from the Weather Channel piece, but here's a little bit more of an extended view of what this looks like. And you'll see, you can see the, the, the moon and the stars turning at the same time. Um, you, you may not be able to see it there, but there's also meteorites occasionally flipping through on the upper portion, portion of the screen. It's just fun to see them. Not, you know, some people say, well, they were planes, but no, there aren't very many, there's not much air activity up here. It's all meteorites and stuff like that. So, so portraits under the aurora. This is like something I wanted to kind of play with. And so this was uh, Katie Lindendahl, who was with the Weather Channel, 
Um, she was along with us and she wanted to do a portrait for her mother under the Aurora and her sister was there as well. So we did some portraits of her. But there's many ways you can do this. Uh, you could use a flash if you wanted to. One thing I found that the flash, even at 1 one twenty eighth power, was still blasting my subject too much. So I really needed to come up with a different solution. So I took my headlight and I used that along with the moon. So practice makes perfect, kind of. The, problem, the X factor in this whole thing is your subject has to remain really, really still. Uh, because if you're looking at long exposures to get that aurora built up into, you know, on the sensor, that, all that color and density, you need, you need some time. Or high ISO. Uh, we, this was at, uh, the picture I hear, have here is a larger one I'll have next, but that was at three seconds. And you gotta have somebody that holds real still. Uh, the flash, as I said, was too much. Uh, you know, I could put a neutral density filter, but I didn't have it at minus 11 at my, you know, in my pocket. I didn't bring it with me for this. But I was just playing. So the, the combination I found that worked great was it was half moon at this time. So you can see behind her, uh, there, I'll have a bigger picture in a minute and I'll show you that. But the, the moon, the main shadows from the moon, uh, and here, I'll show you here. You can see it, the shadow behind her is from the moon. And then all I did was I took my headlamp and didn't incorporate it into the composition of the picture, I just shined it on the, on the snow in front of me. And that was enough light to bounce up and, and fill all the shadows from the moon and just give me a little bit of extra oomph that I needed to, to illuminate the subject. And it worked out really well. Um, so, and then some, you know, you may have some situations that happen like this. One of my Canon colleagues got proposed to right in front of us. And we kind of knew it was gonna happen. Uh, so we were all kind of ready for it. Some of the guys down, down here, they were, they were busy doing their own thing, but you know, how often do you get to sit and actually witness a proposal? Uh, so here's the happy couple here. Um, she had incidentally just left Canon because her husband is a doctor and he got his residency in Michigan, so they moved. Uh, but uh, the Long Island uh, couple and Good luck to them. So that's going to be fun. So then, you know, we just took a couple pictures, and that was kind of fun. And you just never know when stuff like that happens. Now this la this this next picture summed it all up, and we we did we did a picture of this for them. Do you, and this actually happened. You guys see the heart there? Like, oh, look, all the ladies are like, oh, it's so wonderful. This is not Photoshop, guys. I can show you the raw file. This actually happened. And so you never know the shapes that, that the aurora is going to present to you. And that's why you have to stay out there as long as you can bear it. Now, if you're there in September, October, it, it, it ain't that bad because you're probably in shorts. But uh, in the colder temperatures, stick it out because it's worth it. Uh, my contact information is here. Now, of course, <laughs> I don't expect you to write this top one down, but if you go to the Canon Digital Learning Center website, just Google Canon Digital Learning Center. Uh, there's a general email box there if you want to email me. Or if you want to contact me directly, you can hit me up here at the Instagram or the Twitter. Um, I don't do much on Twitter, but Instagram is a little more active. And then, um, so, okay, guys. Thank you for coming. I hope this was informative for you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.